Well, praise God for such great singing and great, great songs of praise and a wonderful orchestra. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't find a, a person to read scripture today, so I'm going to jump right into the scriptures because I'll be covering Romans 15, 1 through 7, hopefully this morning. Those in junior church, you're invited to go downstairs for your Christmas program practice. Can we believe it? Wow, November 14th, Christmas is a little more than a month away. But praise God for our young people and for those that are working on the Christmas program. Praise God. Take your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 14. We have been in the book of Romans since the springtime, and we're coming to the end. We're getting there, we're coming to the end of Romans. What a glorious book. After displaying the wrath of God against all mankind, emphasizing the grace of God that saves us from our sin, breaks the power of sin in our life, and someday, for those who are already in heaven, the, the presence of sin is gone. We looked at the plan that God has for Israel, his chosen people. Right now, they're in a state of rejection and unbelief, but there's coming a day when they will be a believing nation with faith in Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And we praise God for, for that future day for Israel. And then, in the end, chapters 12 through 16, it is, what is the will of God in our life as New Testament believers? First, we present our bodies as uh, our physical bodies, our hands, our feet, our eyes, our nose, our mouth. We present them to the Lord as a living sacrifice. We offer it all to the Lord, and we take nothing for ourselves. He gets my time, my resources, my agenda, my future plans. He gets my body. I no longer am my own. I have been bought by another. And part of that is a renewal of my mind. As I read the Bible, my mind is being transformed and it's being changed and I'm thinking different. And then I'm, as a result of that, I'm behaving different. And then I, I lead a life of humility. I, I, I look for loving others and caring for others rather than myself. It's a whole different change from the way I used to be as an unbeliever. And then we talked a lot about what does loving look like. Love is preferring others before ourselves. It's it's genuine, not hypocritical. So we're real, really, really showing loving and doing loving things for others. We're not just faking it. And then we saw in Romans 13, we have a relationship to this governing authorities. Uh, we, as God has given them the ability to restrain evil and praise good, so we submit to the governing authorities over us because God has delegated that. Although if the government ever has me violate the word of God, or even my God-given conscience, then I, then, I, then I have to be civilly disobedient. Um, but Romans 13 covered that. And then we saw that we have, we have no debt. We are to owe no man anything except one debt we can never pay. I need to keep loving you over and over and over until I'm dead. I just need to keep loving you, and I can never discharge that debt fully. So plan on it. Plan on me loving you and caring for you now until the day I die. That's my God-given debt to you. And so we saw how that all works. So, and then I'm to be watchful because the day of Christ is coming fast. And if I'm alive when he returns, I'll be changed, transformed in a moment, brought up to the, to the clouds to be with the Lord. Or maybe I'll die and be with the Lord. Either way, I'm with the Lord. But that day is coming soon, right? My physical death is coming soon, and maybe the rapture will be today. So we saw all of those things. Now in chapter 14, we started last Sunday evening in the first part of the text, and we see that there's some principles here because you've got a lot of different people in this room and in this church. We have people from all kinds of backgrounds, but even in the early church in Rome, can you imagine the Jewish people? The Jewish people in the church for 2,000 years, well, 1,444 years, they worshiped on Saturdays. That was their holy day that they were not to violate Saturday. That was the day of worship and the day of rest. Now the New Testament church is born, and the teachers and pastors and apostles of the church are saying um, that that is no longer the case. We, we will now worship on Sunday, and, and we'll worship Sunday recognizing it as the, the day of the Lord's resurrection. But the Saturday Sabbath is not, you do not have to hold to the Saturday Sabbath like you did for 1,400 years. That would be a change, wouldn't it? It would be so ingrained in you to rest on the Sabbath that if other people in the church were recreating or working on the Sabbath, you would be horrified and offended. It could be that for 2,000 years, you never ate pork, you never had bacon, you just had a B, you, you just had an LT sandwich, no B. And, and you, you never had a, 
you never had meat and milk at the same time under those kosher laws, or um, maybe you had never had shrimp scampi or something like that. And now all of a sudden you're in the church, and at the buffets after church, you're having other people eating shrimp and having bacon. You know, do you see how this would be a problem in the church? But we've never done that. We've never eaten bacon. You're eating bacon. We don't eat bacon. You love God. You shouldn't eat bacon. All of these things. You know what this is going to create? Division in the church and disunity where this group doesn't like this group. That group has a whole different kind of music. This, these people like to dress like this or dress like that. These people like to eat like this. And oh, and then these people keep Saturday. These people keep Sunday. These people keep Tuesday. Oh, you could have such a divided church. And the church is a family. And isn't it hard to keep a family together where everybody likes one another? What a blessing it is when all of your family likes one another. And there's no division. Same thing in a church. I feel like a dad in a, church, in a, in a family saying, okay, everybody, let's get along. Well, that's what Paul does in chapter 14. There's the stronger, okay, now what we're talking about in Romans 14 are not sinful issues. We're not talking where God says this is sin. Lying, coveting, sexual immorality, adultery, murder, um, lasciviousness, drunkenness, all of these things that are clearly sinful, they are clearly sinful and we are not to do them. If you do them, well, we, we ask you to repent of those and then we come one on one, then two to three on one, and then ultimately the church on one. And if you still will not change your, your mind about the sinful behavior, we cast you out of the church with the whole goal of restoring you back in someday. But we don't let sin just flourish in the church. If you're living in willful disobedience sin, we have a responsibility to love you enough to deal with it. So we're not talking about sinful issues. We're talking about issues that are not moral in nature, but cultural. They're cultural. And in this case, it's about foods that you eat, and it's about days that you might esteem higher than another. So here it is, and I'm just going to review the principles. There is a principle of mutual acceptance. We as a church, we have to get along with one another. We have to receive one another. The idea of receiving one another, it's, it, it, these are bookends. Chapter 14, verse 1, receive one another. Chapter 15, verse 7, where we're going to end up in a little bit, receive one another. Receive one another means to bring in close, to bring close to your heart. It means to welcome like family, to treat like kindred, like, like kin. So to, to receive you means we're going to get along as family. We're going to love together as family. We're going to do things together. We're going to fellowship together. We're going to eat together. We're going to play games together. We're going to serve together. You're going to be brought real close to my heart. Um, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. Don't get in arguments about things that are not essential, things that are not sinful. We're not going to argue about those things. For we're, um, Music is a big deal, isn't it? Everybody has different musical tastes. You could easily begin to think, my music's more spiritual than your music. And while wow, you could have all sorts of arguments, don't dispute over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak, this means that their convictions will not let them eat meat. They eat only vegetables. So you, you have a... I eat meat, and then you have a group in the church, I will never eat meat. It, me, eating meat is sinful and it's wrong, and you're in the same church. Paul says, receive one another, get along, treat one another like family, love one another. Why? Verse 3, the end of the verse, because God has received him. Now, the one who eats only vegetables, they look at the one who eats meat or anything, and they, they judge them. They, they're sinning by eating meat. They shouldn't eat meat. They're not spiritual. If they were more spiritual like me, they would only eat vegetables. Um, therefore, they are wrong to eat meat. Shame on them. You know, you don't do that. If, if, your, if your conviction is eat only vegetables, don't judge those who, who eat meat. If you're one of the meat eaters, you don't despise the vegetable only group. You don't, you don't like, oh, you little babies, stop eating only vegetables. Just bite into a burger once in a while, you little babies. You, know, you don't despise that group and you don't judge that group. What do you do? You receive each other. You welcome each other. You love one another. You, you receive one another in the faith because God receives them. The second principle is found in verses 5 through 9. I said this last Sunday night. It's the principle of a clear conscience. 
When it comes to the gray areas that the Bible doesn't specify as sinful or immoral, and, it, and we just don't know, it's, it's, then you have to live according to a clear conscience. After your whole study of the word of God over this area, can I go to a movie theater? Now, for me growing up, I hated going to movie theaters when I was unsaved. I hated rock music when I was unsaved. I hated alcohol when I was unsaved. I wrote an eighth grade biography, Lincoln Junior High. They said, write a biography about your life. I still have it. Pictures of me in the 70s on my bike with the twirly things and the, and the card with a clothespin on the wheel, you know, on the tire. Wasn't those, those were fun days. And, um, I had, and in the middle of my bi- biography, here I am, an unsaved eighth grader, and I'm like, uh, this world would be a better place without uh, rock, music, drugs, or alcohol, and what else? Smoking. Yeah, I, uh, that was my list. Yeah, I had a list back then in eighth grade, as a, you know, thinking I'm better than others, those smokers, you know, those, you know, whatever. Then when you get saved, then all of a sudden, um, wow, I mean, you, you bring all of that stuff with you, Right? That stuff becomes part of your list or whatever. Um, and again, some of it's immoral and sinful right off the bat. But, but whatever you do, you have to do with a clear conscience. Here's how he says it, verse 5. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully, here it is, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Before you do a certain behavior that is not immoral, that's not sinful. Before you do a certain behavior, you make sure that you are convinced in your own mind. You can do it with a clear conscience. So some people would say, but we always fast on the 15th day of the month. We've always done it as a family. Nobody eats in our house on the 15th day. And I believe that's biblical. So I'm going to fast on the 15th day. All right, as long as you're fully convinced in your own mind, you're going to esteem that day greater than others, okay? As long as you're fully convinced, do it. But don't impose that on the whole church, that type of thing, all right? And then we won't despise you, and you don't condemn us for not fasting on that day. See how complicated life gets? There's another principle, verse 10. So we have the principle of mutual acceptance. We have the principle of a clear conscience. Then last Sunday night, I talked about the principle of no speculative judgment. We're not going to judge one another over things that aren't sinful or, you know, so here's, here's what the word of God says, verse 10. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Hey, listen, everybody. I don't know what you have going on this week. I have already many appointments. I have things in my calendar, 2 o'clock this day, 1 o'clock this day, lunch here. I've got a lot of appointments already set up for this next week. But I will guarantee there is an appointment that you have that you cannot miss and you will not miss you will show up, and it is at the judgment seat of Christ. It is when, after the rapture, the church age is brought before Jesus. He is the judge at the Olympics. It's it's an Olympic festival, and you will either get gold, silver, bronze, or good participation medal, or something like that. And you will present to the Lord all of your decisions as a believer, what you did as a believer. Some of it will have been in the flesh for your own selfish pleasure. It'll get burned up. Some will be good with the right motive for the Lord, and and you will be rewarded for that, and you might receive a gold or a silver or a bronze or a platinum, if that's even better, or a titanium or whatever. But there is going to be a reward, and you cannot miss that day. You'll be there without a doubt. So don't judge one another in the church over these silly things. I'm not talking sinful things. I'm talking silly. You know, pastors have to wear a suit and a tie, and if I don't wear this, we can't have church. Now, if I didn't wear a suit one day, I don't know what you would think. Would you think that I've totally gone unspiritual, that I've totally gone apostate? Uh, You know, I'm just saying. Most pastors I know don't even wear a suit anymore. I don't think, I don't know very, very many people who wear a suit anymore. I wear a suit for my own reasons, not to please you. Um, I like dressing up. So there. But I'm fully fully convinced in my own mind that this is what I want to do to honor the Lord. I don't have to wear the tie, and I don't even have to wear a jacket. Believe it or not, I can still preach without a jacket on. But, um, But who are you to judge me and I to judge you over these things 
because we're all going to stand before Lord individually and we will all individually give an account to him. So I'm just warning you, there's a day coming and you cannot escape it. You're going to show up, your name will be called, and it'll be reviewed. How, how do you want that review to go? Oh, I know how I want that review to go. I, I want the Lord to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You followed my word, you searched it out, you lived with your conscience in good standing with my word, here is your reward. I don't want him to say, here's what you could have had, but now it's all burned up and, and it's gone. So we have this future date. Now, today, the new, and look at it, I spent half my message just on review. But you can't really get into the next text without the review of that, right? Now you know where we're at. This was all based on attitude. Do not despise one another. Do not, do not judge one another. Now the new text. Look down at verse 14. Uh, verse 13. Now we're talking actions. Before I was talking your attitude toward one another, don't judge, don't despise one another. Now I'm talking your, your actual behavior. What should you do? What shouldn't you do? Should you go to that movie theater? Should you eat a, a piece of bacon or five pieces of bacon? Should you have that pork tenderloin today? Yes or no? What, I mean, I'm going to tell you now what to do about your behavior. You're, you're not going to like it. No, you will. But here's what the Word of God says. Verse 13, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. So I'm not going to do any behavior that will cause you to stumble or cause you to fall. And if eating a BLT makes you fall, then I will never eat a BLT the rest of my life. If seriously that will make you stumble into sin and never grow as a Christian, I will never have a BLT. I'll just have an LT. I don't mind. I, I'll, I'm willing to do that so as not to cause you to stumble. All right, this is, here's the next principle. It's the principle of lib limiting my freedom for the sake of love. I'm, li I'm limiting what I do. I'm going to limit my behavior for the sake of love. Now, I have liberty in all things that are not sinful. I, I am free to do all things, provided they're helpful, 1 Corinthians 6, provided they are not enslaving, and, uh, and provided that they are good for others and they, and they edify. So I have these parameters that limit my freedom. So I have the freedom to go to a movie theater, but again, if it's gonna cause you to fall or to be a stumbling block, then I'm going to choose not to go to the movie theater uh, for the sake of love. So I'm going to limit my behavior and freedom so that this body can remain united and, and unified in the Lord. That's the, that's the principle. I'm not going to cause a stumbling block. Look at verse 14. I know and am convinced by the Lord, Paul says. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. So there's, there's nothing ceremonial unclean about not wearing a jacket about maybe listening to this type of music. Now, there can be music that's sinful, and I, I'm just talking about the gray areas. Um, there's nothing unclean in the gray areas. Whether you do it or not is not going to be an issue of sin before the Lord. Um, but, on the other hand, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So Paul says, on one hand, to eat meat, is, it's, you can do it. You're free to do it. But if you think eating meat is wrong and, it, and you'll become unclean by eating meat, then for you, if you were to eat meat, it would be a sin. It would be unclean. So something that is not a sin could become a sin based on your weak conscience. He goes on, verse 15. Yet, if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. If, a, if somebody in the church it becomes grieved over my behavior, then I'm not walking in a loving manner towards you. Then, I'm gonna, then I need to change that behavior. I need to stop eating bacon, or I need to stop going to that movie theater, or I need to stop esteeming this one day as important, or something like that. The end of verse 15. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Do you see how big of a deal this is? Let's say that I love bacon so much. I love bacon. I love bacon. And you, by me, by my eating bacon, it causes you to stumble. 
And then you begin to sin in your own, because you're eating bacon, and you, that violates your conscience. This verse says, do not destroy with your food. So for my little gain of a bacon on a sandwich, for my little gain, I've created a terrible loss. I've destroyed a brother or sister in Christ. This is bad. This is, very, this is a big deal. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Verse, this is how important that brother is. All of you Christ died for, so all of you are valuable. All of you are important to me. So I don't want to destroy you for the sake of a little pleasure and freedom that I have. So I'm going to limit my freedom because Christ died for you and I don't want to hurt you. Verse 16, therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. It could be that the good is my, my, my convictions, my eating bacon, my having meat, um, don't let people call that evil because I'm making you fall and stumble. Do you know what that looks like to the world? Do you want to know what I think would be the greatest testimony to the world? If we all got along. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Everybody works at a place where you don't get along. There's always one coworker that just doesn't get along with everybody. Makes life difficult and challenges everything and we all have that, but wouldn't it be great in the church if we simply all got along? We all received one another? Then the world would look at this body and say, I don't get it. They come from all sorts of backgrounds. They have all sorts of different likes. Some like Mexican food, some like Chinese, some like to feast, some like to fast. And you know what? They love one another and they get along and they work together. It's amazing. That's, that's a great thing. So it could be that the good in verse 16 is the gospel. Do not let your good the gospel message and all that it provides. Don't let that gospel message be spoken of as evil because the world would look and say, Jesus obviously can't fix those people. They can't even get along with one another. Nothing worse than a, a church that splits. What a testimony to the, to the community. Unsaved people look at that and say, I'm so glad I'm not a part of that church. Whoa, you hear how they talk about one another? You hear how they treat one another? I don't ever want, I don't want to be a part of Faith Baptist. Shame on us if the community ever looks at us that way. Continues, verse 17. Why should we limit our freedom? Why do, what's another reason why we limit our freedom uh, for the sake of love? Verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is not about all these physical things. It's not about eating and drinking and esteeming certain days higher than others. It's not about our clothing it's not about these things. It's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God, Christ our King, we his subjects, his family, his um, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. The kingdom of God is way more important than eating and dress and things like that. Again, I'm not talking sinful things. I'm talking things that just some can do and some can't do. So don't ever let those things separate and divide the church. God's kingdom is all about the righteousness he has given us, the peace we have with God and one another, and the joy that we receive in the Holy Spirit. That's what it's all about. Warren right now, do you think Warren up in heaven is, he's worried about, well, you know what? I ate a bacon sandwich in February of this year, and now I feel really bad about eating that bacon. Or is he like, you know, I should have, I should have only eaten vegetables on earth, and I guess I ate pork and I should have only eaten. Is he up there worrying about all of that? No! He's got righteousness and joy and peace and, and there's no division over these things up in heaven. So there's a, that's another reason, you know, to be limiting our freedom for the, for the sake of love. Look at verse 18. For he who serves Christ in these things. When I, when I choose to change my behavior for your sake, I'm serving Christ. I'm actually doing it for him, not for you. So if something I do bothers you, and you're like, I feel like if I do that, Pastor, I would be living in sin, then for me to change my behavior is actually serving Jesus Christ. And it's helping you, but it's actually serving Christ. This is the focus of all these things. Um, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. God accepts us. He's pleased with us. And that's my ultimate goal. My ultimate goal is not to please you. That might be a good pro byproduct, but I'll tell you what, I will never please all of you. And even now, there's people in our church that I cannot please. 
It's just fact, and I can, I'm okay with it. The one that I have to please, no matter what, is God. No matter what, that's what it comes down to. So I want to be accepted by God, and in the process, I'll have passed the test and been approved by others. So I'm serving Christ when I actually limit my freedom and, and live my life so that you might not be stumbled and that you might not fall. Verse 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things, but this is another course of behavior for us. We need to pursue things that make for peace and the things by which one may be edified, that we may edify one another. You want to know what I need to do this week? Rather than focusing on my dress and my food and my music and my, 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 my stuff, I need to pursue things that will bring peace to one another. I want peace horizontally here in the church. I'm, gonna, I'm not at the expense of compromise, but I'm going to pursue peace and find ways to build you up. I want to encourage you and strengthen your faith, make you giants of the faith, give you five stones and a sling to conquer any giants in your life. I want you to know the word of God, love the word of God, serve him with all your heart. So I'm going to pursue, I'm going to actually use my time, energy, and resources to run after providing peace and edification for the whole church, for one another. Now, if we all do that, what's that going to look like? It's going to be great, isn't it? Rather than saying, I'm more spiritual than you, you weak people. You got to be more like me. You know, instead of that attitude, I'm like, hey, let's all grow in the Lord. We're going to have peace with one another. We're going to be unified, and we're going to build up this body of Christ. And I'm, this week, I'm gonna, I get six days to work uh, at this church to build up this church for, for Christ's glory. And if you're doing the same thing, oh, it's just fantastic. It's a great thing. Verse 20, here's the condemnation. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Now, God is doing something in this church. He is. People's lives, people are being born again in this church through this ministry in the last six months. People, people have been born again. People's lives, when they die, will be now in heaven rather than hell. People are growing spiritually. There's a great peace. There's a great unity. There's great singing. We're having a great time. Don't destroy the work that God is doing in our lives and in this church for the sake of a bacon sandwich. Don't do it. Right? Why would you ruin the church over this? Can you imagine if I were to say, all right, you weak Christians, if you men don't wear a tie to church next week, you are not spiritual. Shape up. I want to see a crisp knot. And it better be to your belt and not above or below. Shame on you, weak Christians. Now, am I destroying the work of God going on in the church? You bet I am. For the sake of a tie, I'm going to destroy the work of God in your life? As you walk out of here angry, you turn, you put your car in drive, you gun it and go out and you hit the median and knock a sign over and then you get home and you're angry and you spill the food and you burn your house down and just for the sake of a tie? No! I am not going to destroy the work God is doing in your life and in the church for the sake of a silly old tie. You know, it's not a big deal. You don't ever have to wear a tie here. Ever, ever, ever. All right. Um, and in, you know, what's that? Oh, you can if you want to. Of course. Well, obviously, you can if you want to, and I don't mind. I wear one, but, um, but I'm not making you wear one. And um, no tie in my, in my, at my funeral in the casket. I, I want to be without a tie. There, just keep it closed the whole time. See, I got to tell her these things so it's recorded so then she knows what to do when I die. She's always like, you're obsessed with death. I'm like, I am. I just cannot wait to be with God in heaven. All right, let's keep going, though, before we get sidetracked here. Do not destroy the work of God for, for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. If it goes against your conscience, then it's an evil thing, even though it's a good thing. So um, don't destroy the work of God. Verse 21, it is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, is offended, or is made weak. So I need to watch my behavior. So I'm going to pursue peace, and I'm not going to do anything 
um, by which you stumble or offended or made weak. Some years ago, we had an issue of alcohol in the church. It split the church. A, a whole group left over alcohol. Um, the right to drink it in moderation, um, not drunkenness, of course, but in moderation. Um, other things came up besides that. And people were testing me about this very verse. They were saying, well, pastor, it bothers me that you, that you watch TV. So I'm telling you right now, don't watch TV because you, you caused me to stumble. I'm like, if me watching TV genuinely makes you stumble, yeah, then I will never watch TV again. But I don't think, I think you're just playing that game. They're like, yeah, but if you ever walk into a restaurant that sells alcohol, anything, if you ever walk into a restaurant, you are causing me to stumble, Pastor, so I forbid you, based on this verse, because you're causing me to stumble, you can never walk into a restaurant again. And I'm like, if walking into a restaurant genuinely caused you to stumble, I would never do it. But I think you're, again, playing a game with me. See, so the, it's not just a one-sided thing where the weak runs the church and everybody has to go down to that level. Um, rather, we're working together to produce peace in the whole church, right? So we're not, I'm not throwing my convictions on you and you're not throwing your convictions on the church. So verse 22, do you have faith? Do you have faith that you can do certain behaviors? Do you have those kinds of convictions that it's okay to do certain things? Have it to yourself before God. Keep it to yourself. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. Happy is the man who lives by his conscience. And if what you do bothers other, do, do it at home. Don't do, then just keep it to yourself. If you have faith to do certain behaviors and it's going to be a problem here, just go home and do it. Don't do it here. By the way, if, if eating bacon offends you and then you come to our house for dinner, I'm not going to serve bacon. We have it in the, we have it in the refrigerator. Yes, we have it in the, in the freezer. We won't serve it to you. Why? Because I don't want to be an offense, right? I'm not going to deliberately, I'm not going to deliberately cause you to stumble. Um, happy is the one who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats. All right. So if you think a certain behavior is wrong, like eating meat, then you're condemned if you eat it. It's wrong for you. So what might, what might be right for me could be very wrong for you. And that's okay. The end of verse 23 says, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. Whatever you can't do with a clear conscience, then don't do it. So now in 1 Corinthians 8, I'm not, we're not going to go there, but I'm going to end here. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, um, there were people in the church that would go to Apollos' temple. Like, let's say this is our church, and the building next door was Apollos' temple. And you saw me going into a pagan temple, not to worship a stone god, but to eat the barbecue meat they offer there. Because they offer the animal to the, the false god, the, the false god Apollo. And, um, and then they barbecue the meat, and I go in there and I'm eating it. Because you know what? There's no, that's not, there's, there's no God there, so I'm not even worshiping. I'm just eating a barbecue sandwich. But then you think that's sinful, and you watch me go in day after day for that barbecue. And then you think, well, pastor does it, so I'm going to. So then you, you know it's not right for you, but you go in there. Next thing you know, you're worshiping that stone. You're loving the music and the worship, this, all this false worship. And now you are caught into this, and you begin to perish you don't lose your salvation, but you just have no fruitfulness in your Christian life. See how this works? So if you do it and it's not from faith, you don't know, you're, you're, you don't think it's right for you, but you do it anyways, the Bible says that's a sin to you. All right, so you, now you need, and then you're going to be accountable for it someday. I can go in and it's no problem, but if you go in, it's a problem. It becomes a sin to you. That sin will show up at the reward seat of Christ. So don't go in there. And then I'm not going to go in there because I don't want to lead you in there. So in 1 Corinthians 8, Paul says this. If, if eating meat causes you to stumble, I will never eat meat again. It's just not worth it. Meat's a little thing in, the, in this world. Meat is a little thing when it comes to peace in the church and unity in the church. 
Do you all agree? What's the emphasis? The emphasis on the whole text is to receive one another, that we might be one body, one mind, giving glory to one God. It's such a beautiful thing. We're not, let's not let anything come between us that would cause division and disunity. It's, it's hard enough in this world to live for Christ. Let's not cause a problem in here. And can I tell you something? We don't have a problem. I have no, I'm not experiencing any type of issue like this. We have in the past, but not now. So this is a sweet time of unity. So this is a good, I always like the teaching here um, when we're enjoying such unity and blessing right now. So the end, uh, tonight you'll hear it, chapter 15, verse 7. I thought I could get here this morning, but I did spend a long time in the beginning of chapter 14. Here's the conclusion, verse 7. Therefore, receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. All right, that's where we're going to get tonight. Because there's one more principle with four parts to it. It's really nice. Uh, chapter 15, 1 through 7. Remember, all of this is because Jesus died on the cross, paid our sin, and rose from the dead. And if you believe in him, if you put your faith in him, you have eternal life. And you're part of the body. You're part of his family. And then God says, all right, family, live together. Get, get along, receive one another. Great stuff, isn't it? Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this text. It is so hard to preserve the unity that you have put here. You have, you have brought unity in this church through the gospel and through the spirit and through the word. And now our responsibility is to guard it, to protect it, so it would not be, so it would not be lost through sinful actions and behaviors. And this text is great for teaching us that we need to receive one another in these areas of difference. We all have different backgrounds, different things seem sinful to us that others seem to do with no problem. And they're not clearly stated in your word, Father. So in these matters that are, they're gray areas. You don't specifically address them. They're not sinful or immoral. In these cultural, contemporary issues, um, give us grace that we might be patient with one another, that we might love one another, and that we might get along. Help us to have such a unity and such a joy and a love here that when the world observes us, they are shocked. They are surprised that people with such different backgrounds can get along so well. And this is what we want to do for your glory and honor. And so help us, Father, to be humble and not to be exerting ourselves and our preferences and our rights and freedoms. Help us to limit our freedoms for the sake of love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you all, faith family. If you are here in person, uh, be careful on the parking lot. It might be icy, a little slippery, and uh, be careful driving home. God bless you all. Have a great day. We'll see you at 5 for choir, 6 for the rest of the sermon.